Welcome to episode 8 of the Life in Norway show. Is Norway really the happiest place on earth? It's questions like this that I hope to answer as I interview fellow foreigners who live and work right here in Norway. Today I'm joined by food writer and entrepreneur Whitney Love Bredland. Whitney moved from the USA to Norway in 2007 and now lives in Stavanger together with her Norwegian husband. Whitney writes the popular food blog Thanks for the Food and has published a cookbook under the same name. Today we talk about food and drink in Norway, including the typical daily diet of Norwegians, through to some of the specialities from around the country. Just before we get started, I want to let you know that the sound quality of the interview today is not as good as usual, so for that I apologise. We had a few technical difficulties, which meant we had to record via a good old-fashioned phone call, but I hope you can still take a lot from the interview. You can find out more about Whitney and get links to everything we discuss on the show today on the show notes page at lifeinnorway.net forward slash episode eight. Happy listening. I'd like to welcome to the Life in Norway show, Whitney Love Bredland. Whitney, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, David. It's, it's nice not a problem. Uh, I'm very excited to speak with you. I, I should say that we're friends. We've met in the past, uh, mainly due to the fact that you write a food blog. Uh, I would describe you as a food writer and a food entrepreneur from what I know about you. But how would you describe yourself and what brought you to Norway in the first place? <laughs> well, thanks for the introduction. Um, I don't know if I would describe myself so much as a food um, a food writer. I, I tend to call myself a food enthusiast, but we'll go with food writer since I do have a food blog. Um, just a little bit about me and how I came to Norway. I've been living in Norway since 2007, so this is about my 10th year in Norway, um, which sounds kind of astonishing to say, but yeah, it's been about 10 years. And I came to Norway um, in 2007 because of a relationship that I was in, and I ended up getting a job here in banking analytics and strategy not too far um, after I arrived. Um, my former partner and I parted ways in 2009, just after I had started my MBA. And since I was pretty settled here already, I'd started making friends and really learning the language. And I, of course, had a job. Um, I decided to stay here after we parted ways and I continued to work and further my education. Um, I should say, though, that I um, did my MBA through a um, distance learning program um, through the University of Warwick in the UK. So I spent about three and a half years commuting back and forth between um, Norway and the UK to do my MBA. Um, when I started my MBA, I thought that I needed kind of a, a fun hobby um, just to kind of add something to my life that wasn't academic or work-based. And that's where I started my food blog. Um, I also got really interested in the local food community and local food scene here in Stavanger, and I thought a food blog would be a good way to share my experiences with other people. Um, but not too soon, not too long after I started the food blog, things really started to kind of blow up, and I started getting offers to work on local projects, and um, I ended up finishing my MBA in 2013. Um, writing my cookbook named after my blog in 2014, which is on Amazon. Um, I started up uh, something called Mothal and Stavanger. It was a local um, boutique grocery store focusing on locally produced foods. That started in 2015. Um, I left that business in 2016 and started up my own catering company, turned cafe business, and then this year, um, actually about three weeks ago, I got married to a guy who's from Volda, which is further up the coast in Norway. So that's a little bit about me and my story here. That is quite the tale. You've been a very busy woman. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been very, um, I mean, I've obviously worked really hard and to make a life here and to build a life here that I love and want to live but I've also been really lucky that I've been presented with opportunities that enabled me to really you know fully embrace the things I was passionate about here mm. and when those opportunities came along I I you know 
was of sound mind to take advantage of them. So that's been something I can really um, advocate for and speak to if people are planning on moving to Norway or live here. Is when opportunities come up, take advantage of them. Sure thing. Good. Well, the topic of the show today is food and in particular Norwegian food. And as you say, you're a food enthusiast. I hope you've got some interesting things to to discuss with us. Um, My first question is Norwegian food. It's all salted meats, dried fish and boiled potatoes, right? (laughs) Well, I mean, on the outside, from the outside looking in, I think at least with my, you know, coming from the Anglo world, um, I, when I first moved here, that was kind of what I thought as well. But what I've really learned is um, there are a lot of regional specialities that don't kind of get a lot of airplay with the international crowd that moves here. Um, I think and a lot of that has to do with Norwegians tend to be very humble about the food stuff here in Norway. And I don't think that they should be so shy about sharing a lot of the regional and local specialities like here in so the Stavanger area, um, we're kind of known as more or less the breadbasket of Norway. Um, a, a large percentage of the food that's grown in Norway comes from this part of the country. And so for us here, I mean, we're really lucky that we have a lamb that's raised by the sea in Kutsoy and also in Renesoy. Um, there's also artisan cheese producers in the region that are um, really making their mark in the cheese world. Um, we have other things, vegetables that are grown as a farmer um, that lives on an island not too far away from Slaughter, who's selling fruits and vegetables to some of the best restaurants in the world, and it all comes from here. Interesting so, stuff. So yeah. if it's not all salted meats, dried fish, and boiled potatoes, what do Norwegians actually eat on a day-to-day basis? Maybe you could take us through uh, a daily routine from breakfast through to dinner and um, talk about the times people eat and, and the kind of things that would be on their plates. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, of course there are some um, regional differences, and the regional differences a lot of times have to do with the weather conditions where you live. Um, Norway is a pretty long country. So if you stuck a pin in the city of Stavanger and turn the entire country upside down, you could get as far down as Italy. Um, so there's quite a bit of coastline. Um, and the distance or the amount of sunlight that people have in the summer and in the winter, depending on where you live in the country and how far inland you are, um, really differs. But I'll take Stavanger as an example um, people tend to kind of eat around their work schedule, so they tend to eat pretty early in the morning. Um, lots of grain-based products, of course, lots of bread. Um, one thing to know is that Norwegians really like seeds and nuts in their bread and on top of their bread, which is something that we don't necessarily always do in the U.S. And um, my sister was here um, a couple of weeks ago, and she really commented on the amount of poppy seeds and sunflower seeds that were actually in the breads that we bought from the baker, which is a big difference. Um, people here don't really eat that much fried food either. So, for example, going back to breakfast, typical breakfast might be oatmeal porridge or might be um, a porridge made from some kind of grain, um, usually served with a little bit of jam or fruit. Um, there's always some kind of dairy product included, um, milk or cheese or something to that effect, um, or eating, um, uh, sliced bread with something on top. Um, in Norway, it's called poleg, and that's a general term for any type of spread or sliced meat or sliced cheese that can be put on bread and eaten kind of as a a meal or as an in-between snack. Um, for lunch, lunch tends to um, look very similar to breakfast for some people. Um, there's a Norwegian tradition of eating something called um, a matpaka, which is um, kind of like a sack lunch. And it's usually um, one or two open face sandwiches, um, which can have meat, cheese, some kind of spread on, um, maybe even a liver pate with uh, pickles. Um, there's usually also some kind of fruit, a banana, grape, something like that. And then usually people drink that with some kind of fresh milk or sour milk. And, um, lunches in Norway tend to be rather light and people tend to save up most of their calories to eat with their evening meal. Mm. 
dinner in Norway um, from the outside looking in dinner in Norway on a typical week for a typical family. Um, it is, it is true that most Norwegians eat boiled potatoes at every meal. I can say that that's definitely true. We don't because um, my husband and I are both not that big a fans of potatoes. We tend to eat um, more rice sure. and pasta. Uh, but boiled potatoes are really big here. You'll see them everywhere. Um, and it's kind of said that uh, a Norwegian meal isn't complete without a side of boiled potatoes. <laughs> so I've seen and heard stories of Norwegians, usually older Norwegians, um, not being able to eat, for example, a pasta dish without boiled potatoes on the side. Um, I would say, depending on how far away you are from the coast, here in Stavanger, we tend to eat a lot of seafood. So there's lots of, um, there's boats along the harbor that you can go to that sell um, peel and eat shrimp. And also, um, we have a really nice fish market here, which is really, really nice. So people tend to go there and get fish to eat on the, during the week and on the weekends. And people tend to eat more less complicated meals during the week and something a little bit more extravagant on the weekends. Sure. One thing I noticed when I first arrived, and it still trips me up from time to time now, is the timings of meals. Um, you mentioned breakfast is taken early. Um, in my experience, lunch can be eaten as early as 11 a.m. And, and 12 o'clock is considered late. And then dinner yeah. can be can be anything after maybe four o'clock. And if you're a visitor to the country and you get hungry at nine, 10 o'clock in the evening, especially if you come from a Mediterranean country where that's the, the normal time for dinner, you might be out of luck in a smaller town as, as the restaurants might be closed. And um, what is the reason for that? Is it purely around working hours or are there other cultural reasons for it? Um, I mean, what you say is definitely true. Um, Norwegians tend to eat really early in the morning. Lunch is usually, um, you know, the office I used to work in, the canteen opened at 1030. So when I first started working there, there were times when um, I tend to eat a late breakfast. So there were times when I'd go in to the office and by the time I was ready for breakfast, people were usually, you know, carrying out for lunch. <laughs> um, and people usually tend to eat dinner when they get home. Um, people usually tend to get off work between like three and four o'clock and they usually tend to eat dinner between four and five o'clock. And I think a lot of that has to do with the the darkness in the winter. Right. Um, people want to get an early start and, and get home. Um, but also Norwegians tend to live to work or sorry, they tend to work to live, not live to work. So people don't tend to work extended hours in the office like we would perhaps in the U.S. Um, and that usually means that people, when they get off of work, they go and pick up their kids and then everyone who wants to go home and have a family, a sit down family meal together. Sure. So you, you mentioned that you're not so into the boiled potatoes uh, tradition of, of, of food in Norway. I'm interested to know what you do eat, uh, in particular Norwegian dishes that you especially enjoy. Um, well, in our house, because my um, husband is not from Stavanger, he's from further up the coast where there's more of a hunting tradition, we eat a lot more game here than I think mm. the average person probably does. Um, we usually get um, game um, meat from his parents when we go back to visit them, and if they come to visit us, they usually bring some down with them. Um, I would say... For me, probably my favorite Norwegian dish is I really just like a really nice piece of um, of cod or of salmon that's been, you know, lightly broiled. Um, I've had some really good poached fish in Norway, which I'd never tried before I'd, I'd moved here. Mm. Um, I really like, of course, meatballs with potatoes, <laughs> but I don't eat that that frequently, um, I, I must say. Um, but I, the standouts for me on the Norwegian, the Norwegian table come at Christmas time. And so for me, I really like having the Norwegian Christmas meal is one of my favorites. So eating sandwiches, which is like, um, it's called stick meat or pin meat. And it's um, the ribs of a uh, sheep that have been dried and then reconstituted with water and boiled. Um, also um, pork belly. It's called ribba in Norwegian, and I really love that. Um, and those those dishes are usually only served during the month of December. 
with the rest of the year, we try to eat a lot of local fish, a lot of our vegetables from a local farmer in Randeburg. And well, one of the dishes that is popular in November, December that you didn't mention is, of course, lutefisk. <laughs> uh, any any thoughts on that? Um, well, I have to say, I've had lutefisk three times. Um, and the first time I had it, I really didn't like it. Um, the second time I had it, I actually had it served as a, um, as a, how can I say, as more or less a cocktail dish. So it was served in a small bowl um, with all of the side dishes prepared. So it was served more or less as a, as a kind of tapas side dish. And that was really tasty, actually. And then the last time I had it, it I really did like it. So I think it's a bit of hit or miss. But the thing with lutefisk is you actually don't really taste the fish. Um, lutefisk is more about texture. And Norwegian food, as I've come to understand and come to experience, is a lot more about texture than it is about taste. The tastes here are really mild. Food isn't really deeply seasoned. Um, you know, salt and pepper and emphasis on the salts is it's probably the majority flavor that you tend to get in most Norwegian homes and in Norwegian restaurants. Um but some of this is definitely changing with the influx of new immigrants from all over the world. Um, but lutefisk, it's kind of hit or miss. We should probably explain what lutefisk is for listeners who, who don't know. Perhaps you're, you're better qualified than me to explain. Um, well, <laughs> well, lutefisk starts out as normal cod fish, um, and then it's taken and... Um, goes on a very long yeah, journey it's taken and dried <laughs> and then reconstituted and turned into um it's it's uh can i say cured with a, a lye based solution and that lye solution changes mm. the way that the protein molecules the way that they interact with each other um so the fish the flesh of the fish goes from being solid white flaky um fish that you would normally expect to being more gelatinous yeah and apologies for anyone who's eating their <laughs> breakfast whilst listening to this but uh that is one of the traditional foods here in norway so people sometimes i mean my mom always calls it jellyfish because that's more or less what it looks like it looks like yeah. fish that's been turned into jello but I've, I've had it done a couple of different ways and i've also had the loin area and that's got a little bit more um body to it and a little bit more volume to it so, I mean, there's different ways that you can have it. And um, I have been really surprised over the years to find out a lot of Norwegians, a lot of, you know, kind of younger Norwegians haven't ever tried lutefisk before. So it is mm. something I think the younger generations are underappreciating as part of their culinary heritage. So you've told us of your likes when it comes to Norwegian food. Is there anything that you avoid? Um, I think for me, just because of my curiosity about, you know, Norwegian food and about Norwegian culture, I've tried to keep an open mind. Um, I have my own preferences kind of across food genres and cuisines. For example, I don't really care for organ meats. Um, but having said that, I've had, you know, um, uh, dry cured uh, sheep's heart before in Norway and I really didn't think I'd like it. And it wasn't that bad, actually. Um, I've had a rockfisk a couple of times. And for those of your listeners that don't know, rockfisk is actually rotten fish. So it's fish that's been fermented um, traditionally in the ground. Um, they'd bury this, they'd wrap it in, I think, juniper. They'd wrap it in leaves and then bury it in the ground, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in the winter and then come back for it in the spring. Um, and I've eaten that before, and I didn't like that at all. Um, I don't think there's much I don't like, or there's much, there isn't much that I haven't tried. I try to try everything, but there's stuff that I don't necessarily care for, but I wouldn't care for it if it was, you know, if it was American. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get a little hungry, so we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to take a trip around Norway with you and look at some of the food experiences available. Sounds great. Welcome back to the Life in Norway show. I'm with Whitney Love Bredland, a food enthusiast from Stavanger. Welcome back, Whitney. 
Hey, thanks for having me back. Right, Stavanger then, uh, southwest Norway. Where should a visitor go if they want to try some of the best Norwegian cuisine available and they're visiting Stavanger? Um, well, I would say the first place to go is the first place a lot of people go, which is the fish market. Um, the fish market here in Stavanger is a place that you can buy fresh fish and seafood items and take them home. Um, but it's also a restaurant. So if you just want a really nice piece of cod prepared to order, that's a great place to go. Um, they also have um, a really nice fish soup and um, some of their sandwiches there are some of the best I've ever had. Um, and it's a really nice place to get started because uh, the location where it's situated, um, summertime you can sit outdoors and look over the sea, which is really nice. And it's great for people watching since it's right in the middle of the harbor area. Yeah. But I really like sending people to the fish market to get started because fish and seafood is such an integral part of the story of this region. Um, Stavanger in the um and its previous incarnation was known as a canning town. There's even a canning museum here. So here, a lot of bristling and sardines were canned, um, were farmed in the sea and then canned here. Um, and when you go to places like the fish market, you really get a sense of um, how big canning and how big seafood was and is a part of the local food tradition. Um, other places I would send people, um, <clears throat> excuse me, other places I would send people would be um, here in Stavanger. We have the only, um, uh, we have the only Michelin starred restaurant outside of Oslo in the Nordics. Mm. Um, and it's run, um, it's kind of a conglomerate of restaurants there and I can recommend them all. Um, it's run, uh, the restaurant is called Reno. And it's right in the center of town. Um, if you don't have the opportunity to go to the Michelin starred restaurant, um, the bistro and also the cafe are also really nice places to go. Uh, really nice for sitting um, and just enjoying a meal. Um, the bistro is a place I tend to go uh, with my girlfriends or with my husband for kind of a date night. The restaurant is worth the money and it's worth the wait if you have to wait to get reservations to get in. Um, another place that I really recommend uh, going is there's a craft beer uh, pub in the eastern uh, part of the city in Swanger East, and it's called Us, which means East, um, and they are a craft beer pub that sells only craft beers, um, and there's a local craft brewery here called Lairdig. Mm. And they sell a lot of the experimental beers from Lervig, but it's a great place to go to get an impression of the culture and the things going on in the eastern side of the city. The guys that run it are, um, you know, friends of mine, I'll say that. Um, but I think that they've done a really good job in translating um, a lot of what's been happening in the craft beer movement, not just here in Stavanger or uh, nationally in Norway, but internationally into what's going on at the bar. Okay, so we're going to jump in the car from Stavanger now, or perhaps more appropriately, jump on a plane and head northeast to Rødos in the county of Trøndelag, central Norway, which is not too far away from Life in Norway headquarters. You went to Rødos a couple of years ago now, I think. Um, it's known yeah. by most people for as its status as a UNESCO World Heritage Site for its um, original mining town. Uh, look and feel it's been very well preserved um you can you can tour some of the mines there but what some people don't know about Rodos is it has a, a for a town of 2000 people it has a thriving food scene and um, what what did you learn about that there um well i mean i have to say i was actually really um surprised when i was able to go there um i mean the town is it's there's not that many people there, but anyone in Norway, or I would say most people in Norway in general, and especially in the food community, I mean, it's become this, you know, it's become this gem and, you know, I don't want to say in the middle of nowhere, but it's become this, this unexpected gem because the food culture there has been preserved so well, and it's been ingrained so deeply into um, the identity of the town. Um, one of the largest or the largest organic dairy in Norway is located in the area. 
um, and they've been growing in market share, which is really um, nice. Um, they also, that dairy is really important. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the products that they sell um, is the first um, designation of origin product in Norway. So it was the first and it's um, it's called chuk milk, which means thick milk in the local dialect. Um, but it's it's a fermented milk product, and that fermented milk product is the first designated or designation of origin product in Norway. So all the other designation of origin products have come after that, mm. and that product is really important because it is one of the products that has started. Um, really, or that process has really turned. Um, has really given Norwegians an incentive to start tying their products into their food products into the history of the local area. And, and Rosa was the first to do that. Um, there's lots of, of, it's really, it's a really interesting place because of the terrain. Um, it um, has the, I'm going to, I'm probably not going to say this right, but it is classified as a desert. Um, because of how dry it is there, mm. which means in the winter when it snows, because it's so, it snows quite a bit and it's in a bit of a valley. So there's lots of snow in the winter time, and there's um, but there's not a lot of rain in the summertime. I think I got that one right. Um, which means that there's lots of that there's much more greenery for the animals to feed on. So animals gestate. Um, they they gestate sooner there than they do in other places, right. which means that you get fresh meat and you get younger animals and fresher meat than you do in other areas of the country because there's more greenery for them to feed on. It was really interesting when I was there because I was able to go on a food safari, um, which meant that I got to go around and really see um, food stuff from all over the region. We had um, cake and coffee, which is a Stavang, uh, which is a Norwegian in between meal, um, in um, a cabin that was over 200 years old, which to me as an American was kind of mind blowing that I was sitting in a cabin that was, you know, almost older than the country I come from. So that was pretty outstanding. Um, the locals there have been really good about preserving um, the traditions. Um, and being able to express those to others. So I think um, being able to go there, you can go to the tourist office and book a place on a food safari, and they basically put you on a mini bus and take you around the farms in the area, and you get to try some of the local cuisine, hear the stories, meet some of the farmers and the food producers. It was really, really magical. Mm. And even if you just have time to call into the town briefly, uh, the the tourist office, I think, actually, since you you've been there, it's been improved, and they now have a food annex, so you can buy the the rarest butter, uh, you can buy the ice cream, you can buy the flatbread, uh, and all the other products that that carry the rarest name right in the tourist office itself, which is a a really nice uh, a nice thing to do, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think um, just going back to that point, there's actually a food, there's actually a marketing agency there if i can say that um the a, a bunch of the food producers because there's so many um artisan food producers in that area they have they kind of um partnered together to form this marketing agency that basically helps market their products um out to the rest of the country and it's really nice they've opened up that shop there mm. because there's really good cured meats dried fish there's some special types of cheese that specifically come from that area um, there's also a um, producer there who grows um, herbs and um, florals that are native to that one part of Norway that they dry and you can get them as tea and as herbs that they ship out all over the country. So that's really great. Okay, so we've done Stavanger and we've done Nuros. Is there anywhere else in Norway you'd like to take us to? Well, I mean, being from Stavanger, I probably shouldn't say this, but I think the food scene in Oslo is something to note. Um, there's um, Maimo and Oslo, which has three Michelin stars. So if you'd like to go to a restaurant for fine dining, I think that that's really a place to head to. But Oslo is really great because it has parts of the city that have really been kind of discovering what it means to integrate um, local Norwegian foodstuffs with 
um, the growing immigrant communities. And mm-hmm. I think, and also they have the largest immigrant community and there have been some new trends there um, and some new restaurant concepts there that are really interesting. So if you have the chance, I think heading to um, Grunerlacher or to Grunland and also um, I don't think you'd be disappointed either. Good stuff. Okay. Back in the home at grocery shopping. Now, for any of our listeners who are from the US or the UK or have been there, you'll you'll know the the Walmart style uh, supermarkets that um, that stock pretty much everything with a, an abundance of choice. It's it's almost difficult to to find just uh, plain old regular milk with all the different kinds that you can find in in the US and the UK. <laughs> Now, shopping yeah. in, a, in a Norwegian supermarket is, is not quite the same. Is that right? No, that's, that's very, very true. Um, when you say you're going to the grocery store in Norway, you kind of have to know in advance what you're looking for because not all places to buy food are actually um, what we would recognize as grocery stores or supermarkets. So some um, places to buy food, and I'll just use the word grocery store just as a general term, Some grocery stores in Norway are not full service, meaning they don't have like a fresh fish counter. They don't have like a deli counter. um, They don't sell fresh cheeses. um, They don't have someone, for example, like working behind a counter that can give you service Mm. to get these different kind of deli type items. So there are only a couple of, I think there's only two, there's only two or three chains of grocery store in Norway that actually have the full service experience. And those tend to be nicer grocery stores. Um, They usually tend to be a little bit more expensive. And they usually tend to stock items that the average Norwegian wouldn't necessarily use every day, but that they would maybe use from time to time. Um, Or when they were hosting, you know, um, parties or celebrations in their home. Um, Then you kind of get to um, supermarkets or grocery stores that are for more like everyday items, items. where you would go in and there would be, you know, one brand of milk, um, maybe like a, um, a skim milk, a 1% or a 2% milk, and then a full fat milk. But you get those only in one brand. Um, and the previous type of store that I, just, that I mentioned, you get, you know, two or three brands, for example. Um, and the stores that have a smaller selection, um, I think things have really changed in the last five years, but you would, for example, if you don't drink uh, cow's milk and you wanted almond milk or soy milk or rice milk, you might find soy milk or you might find um, milk made from oats, which is really um, popular in Norway, Um, but you may not find both. So if you have, excuse me, food allergies or if you're vegan and if you're vegetarian, some of those products that we, in the States at least, tend to find in a full in a regular grocery store you won't find them there so how does someone who writes a food blog uh cooks a lot at home uh, and has actually released a a norwegian cookbook uh, deal with this uh, is it a case of just a lot more planning or do you learn to cook with uh, a smaller range of ingredients um i mean i think it tends to be for me at least it's a bit of both i mean for our everyday cooking um you know of course I have those kind of like I have those tricks up my sleeve that allow me to be able to if we want you know if we want certain things during the week just as a treat or just that we want you know I kind of make the exception and go to like the nicer grocery store and kind of pick them up um but I mean I when I first moved here I spent a lot of time um, when I traveled buying food products and bringing them back to Norway. Right. Um, but I've kind of a little bit gotten out of that because I've, you know, obviously learned a little bit more about what's out there. Um, but also, you know, planning is a big, is a big part of it now. So if I know that, you know, I know kind of more or less what is sold and most of the grocery stores here just out of habit and out of missing you know, X, Y, Z. So I tend to either, I've learned to make those things on my own in bulk and kind of freeze them down, or I tend to kind of, um, we tend to either like buy in bulk and share with friends or 
bring them in, have friends bring stuff in, mm-hmm. or we order, we find places to order it online. And that's kind of what's been the big game changer for us is being able to buy products online in Norway and have them shipped to our home. Well, I'm sure anyone who has listened to the whole episode so far is going to be very interested to hear a bit more about this cookbook that we've been mentioning, which is called Thanks for the Food, the same as your blog, which I believe is thanksforthefood.com. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so what can one expect to find in the uh, recipe book? Could you give us a, a couple example recipes that are in there? And also, I'm really keen to know why you wrote it. Um, well, I'll start with why I wrote this book mm. um, to start off with. Um, I When I first moved to Norway, I mean, eating and food are the, are, you know, food is the easiest way to get in contact with someone else's culture. Sure. You don't have to speak the language. You don't actually even have to go there. You can be in your own home and enjoy a meal from, you know, whatever country it is. So food is always the easiest way to get in touch with someone's culture. And when I first moved to Norway... Of course, I really wanted to learn as much about the place that I had moved to as possible, but I felt like Norwegian culture was really out of reach for me. Um, So food kind of seemed like an easy way in, and the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn, the more I tested out recipes and heard stories, the more I wanted to learn, and that's kind of where sharing on my blog came from. And the cookbook um, came about because I had... Um, several people asking me, like readers asking me. Um, I also get, because of my blog, emails from people all over the world who have studied in Norway, who are partner with Norwegians and living outside of Norway, people who are Norwegian Americans or Norwegians have Norwegian roots that live anywhere in the world. Mm. And people want, you know, those classic recipes that they've heard their grandmother speaking about, or they want something a little bit more in depth than what they're finding online. So that's kind of where the cookbook came about. Okay. Um, also for me, obviously I work in the digital space, but not everybody is online. And um, some people really wanted a hard copy of some of the classic recipes I had posted on my blog, but also they wanted to see how Norwegians eat nowadays or how to incorporate ingredients that they could find in Norway if they lived here into kind of their daily, everyday um, life or lifestyle. So that's where the cookbook came from. Um, I would say my, like one of my favorite recipes in the whole um, book is something called One Dough Mini Buns. Um, Norway has a fairly strong tradition of eating yeasted buns and this comes from their history with Denmark Mm. Um, but this like bun recipe is more or less a brioche style um, dough recipe but that dough can be turned into several different types of buns that people would eat um, with paired with coffee so it's a really kind of easy way to introduce yourself to um, some of the the uh, dishes and, and stuff that we kind of have here in Norway. Um, also, Norwegian gingerbread, there's a recipe for that in there. I've included a recipe even for pickled herring in my book, which is really nice as well, in the Christmas section. Um, I would say kind of as an everyday dinner recipe, uh, I've included a recipe for reindeer steak with brown cheese sauce. And if you're feeling a little bit less adventurous, um, I've included my recipe for lapskous, which is a Norwegian meat and potato stew. Interesting stuff. Well, I can tell you that you have one fan who's sitting at home in Britain right now, who happens to be my mother. Uh, she bought your book <laughs> when it was released and has made the gingerbread recipe, I believe, which went down very well. So you, you have a fan. Uh, congratulations on that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think... One thing I've been really proud of, if I can say, about the cookbook and just about my journey with the blog is um, it's really helped me understand, you know, if if I didn't understand it before, I really understand now how important it is to stay connected to um, other people and to other cultures and doing that through food just is, it's just a no-brainer, you know, it's such an easy way to come in contact and to begin to have an appreciation for other people's cultures sure thing 
Well, Whitney, you've had a really interesting journey so far. I'm interested to know what's next. Um, well, uh, what's next is a, is a bit up in the um, air for me. Um, I kind of, you know, really rather recently decided this is the first time in probably seven or eight years that I'm going to take things as they come and not have a plan going one or two years down the road. Um, our cafe business is still going strong and we're looking for um, a, lo- a location to set up in. So that will be coming in 2018. Um, and also, I mean, there's several things, I think, on the personal side that will be going on in the next year or so. So we'll see some changes around the house. Uh, that sounds really interesting. And I, I hope you will yeah. come and join us again next year when the cafe business is up and running and tell us all about it. Yeah, definitely. And if anybody, um, I, I just want to make sure that I've said this um, because it's something that I have said in the past and I think it's really important to remember. I left the U.S. in 2005 and first moved to Germany and then after two years moved to Norway. Mm. And when I was in the U.S. Um, in 2004, 2005, I really wanted to move to Europe, but I didn't have a game plan and I didn't really know anyone. I had a couple of friends from when I studied in England that lived here that I knew, but I didn't really know anyone, and I didn't really know how I was going to manage. And um, I don't know if it was just youthful ignorance or maybe I was really brave, but I kind of just one day just decided just to do it. Mm. And, you know, 12 years in, I'm still here. I'm still doing my thing. I've been gainfully employed, like, you know, thank God, since I moved here 12 years ago. And it hasn't always been easy. Most of the time, it's been very, very difficult and very complicated. But I always stuck it out and found a way to make things work. And so I would just say to anyone who feels inspired by my story or the story by any of anyone else that you have on your podcast, if you feel like you want to try to live abroad or study abroad or take a chance and learn a new language or learn about a new culture, do it. I could not agree more. Nothing to lose. I could not agree more. Whitney, we're almost out of time, but before we go, I'll ask you the same three questions that I ask everybody. Uh, Quick answers, please. What's the best thing about living in Norway? The people, the food, and of course, my husband. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) What's the most challenging thing about living in Norway? The weather, without a doubt, the weather. In the winter or all year round? Uh, for me, in the winter, I'm really sensitive to the lack of sunlight that happens in the winter time. So, for six months out of the year, I really struggle. Yeah, I imagine the difference between the southern states of the U.S. and uh, southern Norway could not really be be greater. Yeah, it's it's brutal at times, but you know, I find a way. Okay, and the final question: What's your favorite place in Norway? Stavanger. Anywhere in particular? Uh, besides my home, um, <laughs> there are a couple of um, spots along the coast not too far from our house where you can um, they've installed public benches. And so at times it's really nice to go down there and, you know, have a seat and just watch the ferries pass by. That sounds lovely. Whitney, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find out more about you and some of your projects? Um, so people can find out more about me on my blog. That's thanksforthefood.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at thanksforthefood, or they can find me on the website for our cafe business, which is Cafe South. That's C-A-F-E-S-A-U-S dot N-O. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Whitney. You're welcome. 